Welcome to this conversation in process. I'm Jay McDaniel, editor of a website called Open Horizons. This conversation is sponsored by Open Horizons and also by the Cobb Institute, a community for process and practice. Open Horizons and the Cobb Institute have similar aims. One of our aims is to understand and explore a process outlook on life with its emphasis on interbecoming, the intrinsic value of all life, the presence of fresh possibilities, even in times of trial, and the need to create communities that are creative and compassionate and participatory, humane to animals and good for the earth, with no one left behind. Another of our aims, however, is to learn from people that practice what we call the process way, even if they're not especially interested in the process outlook. One of the practices of the process way is to listen. It's to learn from people. It's to be humble in the presence of others and realize they may have wisdom we lack. So in these conversations, we'll be talking to some people who know a lot about the process outlook and some who know very little, but who practice in ways that we want to learn from. Today, we're pretty fortunate because we have in our presence someone who both knows a lot about the process outlook and practices the process way. It's the person after whom the Cobb Institute is named, John B. Cobb, Jr. You may or may know not, you may or may not know John Cobb. Many would consider him the founder or at least the most influential thinker in the process movement. He has published over a hundred books, countless articles. His range is immense. He can talk about economics. He can talk about public policy. He can talk about spirituality. He can talk about interreligious dialogue. He can talk about China, he can talk about world affairs, and he can also talk about Christian theology and its basic beliefs. And that's because he is a Christian theologian. He was also my teacher, so for years I called him Dr. Cobb, and it probably took me several years to learn to call him John. And that's what I'll do in this interview, but it doesn't come easily. But I've asked him to share with us some of his views on basic Christian beliefs. God, Christ, church, Bible, sacraments, life after death. And here we go. John, thank you so much for being with us today and with me today, my teacher. So what I would like to talk to you is, with you is exactly about those matters. And I wonder if you might begin by sharing a little bit about the really young John Cobb, the John Cobb who was once a child, a teenager. Uh, can you say a word about what God meant to you then or didn't mean to you? Uh, a word about the early John Cobb. <laughs> well, um, thank you. It's not a topic that I talk about very much, but I'm happy to reminisce. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents were Method, Southern Methodist missionaries in Japan. So I was, I grew up in Japan and I uh, grew up in a, a context of, I would say, uh, social gospel pietism. The, Today we have a too much tendency to think that pietists are not interested in what happens in society. And uh, social gospel people are not interested in the inner life. But I think that was simply not true of the church at the time I grew up. Uh, I was, they were Methodists and that's probably uh, different from being a Presbyterian in that the emphasis in Methodism, at least coming from John Wesley, is that the whole of Christianity is about growing in love. 
and being having becoming more loving and therefore less dependent on anything else. It's the old, old Christian idea from Augustine on, love God and do what you want. Uh, however, I would say that um, the pietism that and the social gospel, but the combination of the two that I grew up with was legalistic not extreme in most respects, but quite extreme with respect to sex, to alcohol, and tobacco. Those were the three. And of, course, of the three, the one that was most destructive, and legalism is always destructive, was about sex. Uh, I think in most respects what I grew up with is something I still prize, but I still suffer from having been brought up with the anti-sex attitude. Is that enough? Yes, now, John, during that time, um, many of us know, and we'll have you talk about your understanding of God now, uh, did you experience God uh, as legalistic? Did you think of God as legalistic? Uh, or, or not in those early years? I, I don't, I, I mean, if, of course, I, I associated the things I should not do mm -hmm. with belief in God, but uh, God was a loving God. And um, I could talk to God about anything. And I didn't expect God to be angry or punishing. Uh, so it, the legalism was not the worst kind of legalism. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that uh, God has rules and if you don't uh, obey those rules, God's gonna hate you or punish mm -hmm. you. I never had that feeling about God. Was there any emphasis uh, in those early years on hell? Um, I don't remember ever hearing much talk about hell. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it, hell was the sort of topic which if you directly asked my, if I had directly asked my father, do you believe in hell? I think I would have made him uncomfortable and I don't know what he would have said. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, some of us have read your uh, autobiography, some of us have not, but as I understand it, there was a time in your life um, before the University of Chicago or maybe when you were there, when you uh, were at least tempted by unfaith, tempted by atheism, or tempted by a rejection of of God altogether. Um, can you say a little bit about that and correct yeah. me in my generalization? Well, it was in, in many ways uh, somewhat paradoxical that I had been uh, studying among other people with Charles Hart's on and I found him very convincing. And the kind of God he talked about was very similar to the God I'd grown up with, of course, there were enormous differences in terms of the ability to articulate this, but, but I didn't have any problem. But it was uh, also a time when I was immersed in modern thinking through the total university climate and all of my teachers. And uh, I realized that the more fully one is immersed in the, in the thinking of modernity and in the academic work of, of modernity, the less place there is for God. Uh, God cannot, it would be a contradiction of the modern worldview as expressed in the modern university to say that it, with respect to any question whatsoever, including religious experience, that God plays a causal role. 
and that um, I, I was enough, uh, what to say, psychically involved in that, that even though I had arguments against it that I got from Hartzard, the uh, argumentatively I was convinced, but existentially, God just disappeared. And uh, since I had been in conversation with God for 21 years, not having a conversation partner was a shock. John, was the uh, recovery of that conversation partner, uh, did that happen gradually uh, or suddenly? Uh, how, did, how did that faith get recovered? Gradually. It, I, I had to... Um, I had to come to terms with modernity as a whole. And it took me a while to be able to understand that modernity as a whole is one historical epoch with good features and bad features. Uh, I mean, I might have even said that earlier, but really realizing you don't have to believe what modernity teaches and that modernity has not been very wise. So it, that, that's not a sudden insight. It was a, a gradual ability to say, I don't have to believe what all these authorities are telling me. And the authority of the university is very powerful. Mm -hmm. it, it's not a matter of this, this teacher or that teacher. It's the ethos of the modern university and to be able to say, well, I don't care. I think there are more important norms than to serve the university. That's, I was, uh, what should I say? I think I grew up tending to respect authorities. And there is no greater authority than that of the university in our culture. I mean, in the elite of our culture. And to, uh, to challenge that authority takes time. I, 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 mean, I mean, really, I, verbally I could argue something, but in terms of existentially not being not 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 taking their authority as more as as greater than my own <laughs> it, it takes a while to develop that kind of confidence now john uh some people listening in will know about the view of god that you have developed and espoused over the years uh, beginning among other places in christian natural theology and as you know, today, there are many people that are uh, drawn to that, among other reasons, because it invites them to recognize God's power as invitational, persuasive, not coercive. And that's a watershed difference for them. Uh, oh, I hadn't thought of that. That makes a difference. Yes. It but I'm wondering, I'm wondering for you, did, did you ever think of God's power um, in dominating terms, was the God in whom you believed always persuasive, not coercive, or not? Yes. Well, I, I think that it, in spite of the fact that I had not read Wesley, that Wesley's influence, Wesley never speaks of God as coercive. Wesley avoids using the term, any term like uh, omnipotent with respect. So that I, I grew up, the, the God I cared about, the God who died for me, was a loving God and not a... Not a uh, I remember a little ditty that was very popular among young people. God has no hands but our hands to do God's work today. God has no feet but our feet to do. So that was my understanding of God. God was not one 
coercive actor alongside of others. God acted in and through us. At least that, I mean, I was not aware that that was a different attitude, a different mm -hmm. view from other people's, but, but that, uh, I, I found that very moving and, and uh, convincing that God, God doesn't uh, pick up things. God doesn't push things around. I, I, I don't think, I, I think I learned it from Wesley without thinking. And I think I'm very fortunate to be a Methodist. I'm very sad that most Methodists don't know anything about Wesley. And that the Methodist hymnal is not faithful to Wesley. All the, uh, half the prayers in the Methodist hymnal are addressed to Almighty God. That's not Wesley. There's another side of God and process theology that uh, was so important to Charles Hartshorn and perhaps to you as, as well. Um, it's that side of God which uh, absorbs the, the sufferings and the sins and, and the joys of all, that feels the feelings and truly is uh, an everlasting companion mm -hmm. to the joys and sufferings of the world. Uh, was that side of God also important to you or is it now? God is companion. Well, well God, God is companion was absolutely important to me. God, God was the companion who understood me completely and who accepted me completely, even though he and God and I discussed my limitations. <laughs> uh, so, so Hartson gave me a way to talk about that that did not make of God simply another more inclusive being like myself. I mean, this, there's no doubt that I had a very anthropomorphic view of God. And I would have recognized that God is not a human being, not that much like us, but nevertheless, th that was the, that was the image. And uh, so I think process thought gave me a way of understanding, yes, God is a companion, but God is, a, is the companion that is in everything and not a companion that is one more being alongside of everything. It was, it was, that was no shock to me in, in learning that. It was a joy to learn it. But I, I didn't grow up with that. Uh, John, I'd like to turn to Jesus. Yes. And um, if your book, Christ in a Pluralistic Age, uh, really helped me. And, and I struggled, I think one time we were together and, and I said, I think I believe in God, but I'm not sure about Jesus. <clears throat> and you looked at me in, in your kind and teacherly way and you said something like, uh, give it a little time. And, and you were uh, writing Christ in a Pluralistic Age at that time. And that book with the image of Christ as Logos, um, as a spirit at work throughout the whole world, uh, really, really helped me. And, and thank you, thank you. So I'll speak of that as Christ as Logos, but then there's also Christ as Jesus, uh, the man. And I'd like you to speak a little to both of those. Uh, let's start with the man. Um, yeah. How important is he to you? Why is he important? Can you say a word about that? Well, I, th I think that uh, naming the Logos Christ is less important to me now than it was then. Mm -hmm. But uh, Jesus is more important. I, I, at least uh, I have been... Uh, willing to articulate what may have been true all along for me, I don't know. Uh, I, I consider myself one who wants to be, and I think is, a disciple of Jesus. 
and I sometimes feel more comfortable saying that than saying I'm a Christian. The word Christian has come to have, has, has picked up so many meanings along the way that, that I am not, am not comfortable with. But uh, today I'm very impressed by the uniqueness of Jesus. I have a picture that you can see on the screen behind me of Jesus as in the lotus position. Um, and I think it's fine to say that Jesus was enlightened. And um, in, in the Buddhist sense. But I have become much more explicitly and consciously focused on history and the spirituality of India and China is not, does not find meaning in locating oneself in the historical context. The effort in those spiritualities is to locate oneself in an unchanging context. And um, Jesus, I'm quite confident, believe that he was the Messiah. That's a very historical definition. And that's what Christ meant originally. The anointed one was the one who Jews did not have any very clear identification notion about whether God was in the Messiah in a unique way. That, I mean, those were not the questions. The question was there was a huge historical problem and God cared about what happens to human beings in history. And as I have become more and more obsessed with the fact that we live in the last days of a time of plenty, I mean, I don't mean that everyone has plenty, but the world had plenty. It's so simply we, we have distorted it by private property, um, the hoarding it in a few hands and that kind of thing. But we're moving into a time when there simply won't be enough food for people. Um, the, the fact that we must, we must do what we can to reduce the starvation that faces so much of humanity. To me, this has become spiritually the most important thing. And realizing that that's a way of understanding spiritual responsibility that has come to us only from Israel. And that it is, although I, I certainly appreciate the whole prophetic tradition, and one can find almost everything we can find in Jesus somewhere else, something very much like it. I know it's through Jesus that it comes to me. And uh, saying I want to be a disciple of Jeremiah, that's, that's fine. But I don't want to be a disciple of Jeremiah. I want to be a disciple of Jesus. And it's quite wonderful that the, the most uh, historically unique event in history in recent times, I think, was when Gandhi decided that he wanted to be a disciple of Jesus. He could have, he could have found the basis of everything he said in Hinduism, I'm sure, very important to him. But nevertheless, it was Jesus who he looked to. He never ceased being a Hindu, but he was a much better disciple of Jesus than 99% of those who call themselves Christians. So that's one of the reasons I'm less convinced that I must call myself a Christian. Uh, Christianity has been so distorted by so many figures like Anselm that, um, but, but Jesus has, has a message for our world 
Of course, Jesus was not successful. I mean, to, and the likelihood of having success in the sense of preventing a massive loss of life in the next 50 years, probably the next 20 years, uh, is not very great. And I don't think Jesus ever thought it was going to be that what he was committed to was something easy and it would happen. But that helps. And what we need to do in order to, in order to meet that requirement is love one another and love the whole world and love God. Be open to God. Seek God's guidance. And one can find comfort and meaning in that, even when you don't expect to be successful. John, is the, uh, is the cross of Jesus important to you, and, and how so? Or if not, um, can you say a word about that? Well, uh, I, I have been impressed by the realization that uh, in the first uh, 800 years of Christianity, uh, the crucifix was not part of the art of the church. And the, the, the focus on Jesus' suffering uh, as something sort of inherently valuable came about in ways that I think distorted Jesus himself and, and uh, distorted the understanding of Abba, the, the one God that Jesus worshiped. That doesn't mean that the fact that Jesus was crucified and suffered on the cross has no importance for me. I think it's very deeply moving. And that uh, to be a disciple of Jesus is to be open to being crucified in one way or another. Obviously, that's not the way. Literally being crucified is a very unlikely thing to happen. But uh, suffering rejection, and sometimes suffering in direct persecution, I have had no experience of persecution. I have had experience of being belittled, and that's, it's very, uh, if one is a disciple of Jesus, uh, one does not uh, worry about whether this is a popular view, or whether it's one that, uh, that would gain you some kind of advantage. And uh, I, I, think, I think knowing that he didn't make it. You know, he, he was, the Messiah was supposed to create a situation in which the people of Israel were not oppressed. And Jesus saw that their, uh, their effort to free themselves by revolting against Rome was absolutely misdirected. So he offered them another possibility, love the Romans, act in terms of that love, but only very few really heard that. Anyway, I try to be a disciple of Jesus, yes. Uh, there are some Christians uh, for whom the crucifixion also reveals the side of God as vulnerable and suffering. Yeah. Uh, you believe that? Well, I, I believe that God is vulnerable. If, if seeing the crucifixion helps people to, to understand mm -hmm. that, that's fine. I, I'm not. Mm -hmm. but, I got you. but I don't think God was any more vulnerable when Jesus was crucified than God is always wrong. Hmm. Now, can you say a word uh, about hmm. the resurrection? Yes. Uh, 
is that important to you? How so? How do you understand it? Yes. Well, I think uh, I, I, I'm, I'm also a, a great admirer of Paul. I, I think Paul is still the greatest theologian in Christian history. And uh, to, if we could get back to Paul, we'd get rid of a lot of the stuff that is causes so many problems. And uh, without the resurrection, we wouldn't have Paul. It was a resurrection experience. But for him, of course, uh, it had nothing to do with an empty tomb. It had nothing to do with the body that had come, you know, that kind of resurrection. So what, what Paul understood by the resurrection it's uh, the, the, it was the, the, the resurrection experience of Paul, seeing Jesus, hearing Jesus. Why do you persecute me? That made him think about why did he persecute Jesus? Well, he, he could answer that question, but it no longer claimed him. And Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was the anticipated one. And the fact that the people whom he tried to save would not follow creates a whole new, new dimensions of thought. And I think it, it is I mean, I think that his experience of Jesus was probably very much like the experience that a good many people have had of a loved one who comes to them in a very visible way and gives them information. There's so many stories of that kind that I don't see any reason to be skeptical. But of course, most of that is, is useful with respect to reinforcing the idea that there is more life, one other adventure. But the, the real importance is a matter of who appears to somebody, what do they say? And a lot of it is you know, very valuable and helpful. My brother committed suicide, that was a very painful experience for all of us, and perhaps most of all for my mother, who was in Japan at the time. And uh, Jane, my brother appeared to Jane, to her, in a dream. And that's another way in which we can be addressed. It was immensely reassuring to her. So it was a very important, but of course not historically important. So, so that, I think the resurrection appearance to Paul was the basis of our having a Christian community today. So just for listeners uh, to this who, who find the whole idea of resurrection appearances incredible or not scientific or not allowable, um, only to be understood metaphorically, uh, merely metaphorically. Um, I don't hear you saying that. Is that? Is that, I, hear you saying that, that I don't hear you no, saying that. I, no, no, I, no. I don't think I ever thought thought that way. But of course, that's modernity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if one is modern, that's what one has to say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you want to be accepted in a university, that's what you have to say. But, as, but but you understand, I have really rejected the authority of the university. And so I don't I'm, feel any need to say that. I, I think it's so much better to pay attention to the evidence rather than to be metaphysically, dogmatically committed to a particular worldview that came to dominate the modern university. And the metaphysics to which I hold these, these questions wide open and the empirical evidence 
is fairly strong that uh, is that there are I think that the uh, widespread, relatively widespread experience of near-death experiences mm -hmm. has finally kind of broken the stranglehold. Uh, people of in total, uh, what should I say, respect in the academic community have had the experience. And when they say they've had the experience of mm -hmm. And they know all the other explanations. <laughs> it, it has become harder for the modern university to maintain its dogmatism on that point. Now, the modern university, as you know, can, can lead people to be embarrassed if they actually say they believe in a continuing journey after death. Exactly. But, but you're not saying that. And so. I am not modern. <laughs> <laughs> you think I'd get that point. <laughs> so do you want to say a word just about the notion of life after death and continuing journey? I know your focus is on this life, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on whatever comes after as you understand it. Yeah. Well, uh, if, if, if God is a God of love, and if it's God's love that that uh, recreates the world every moment. And if there is good evidence that, that, that there are experiences that people have which are separate from the body, that's almost all of these uh, near-death experiences give clear evidence to that. And then the idea that when our physical bodies end, uh, we are, there is no further experience is, it may be, I mean, I, I still don't, I don't think we have proof about these kinds of things. But I also think that to be a, uh, to be a disciple of Jesus is to say, whether there's anything more is not, is, it should not be determinative. But that uh, one, that the reality seems to be such that, that there is more, can be a source of reassurance, of joy, and but the most important thing, given the history of Christianity in this respect, is to say we do not believe in a God of judgment who is going to punish some people. God treats us lovingly. Now, people who cannot accept love and may not find there are some wonderful writers on this subject. I recommend C.S. Lewis. Uh, I, I love his picture that the people who are in hell can go to heaven any day they want. But they're very uncomfortable when they get there. They're more comfortable in hell. So a lot of them choose to stay there. Okay. And I think many people create their own hells. Yeah. And that that probably will not end. So in that sense, we can talk about hell. But that's because we resist God rather than because God wants us to be there. John, um, a word about the Bible. Uh, do you think of yourself as a, as a biblical theologian? Uh, and perhaps more importantly, um, how important is the Bible for you or not for you? Can you say a word about yeah. the role of the Bible in your life and thought? Well, obviously, the Bible has been important in my life. Uh, I was influenced by a pietistic approach, and that has not survived very, very much. But um, historically, the Bible is the only source of historical thinking. 
it. And that's maybe seen like a, there may have been other sources, but I mean, it's, it's the only surviving source. Uh, no other culture besides these ancient Jews found the meaning of their lives by locating themselves at a particular historical situation. And it's very interesting for me that as the modernity takes more complete control of the university, history is disappearing. There had been no, um, this doesn't mean that no one is interested in exactly what happened on some day at such and such. And you can get lists of rulers but the, the idea that that is the way you find out what your life is about. So I have, I'm more impressed by the unique role that the Bible plays, that no, none of the other great ways of humankind had anything comparable to that. Now the historical orientation has done lots of harm as well as lots of good. Though I, I don't want to make it sound as if, but uh, I, I think of myself historically. And uh, that comes from the Bible. And when the Bible ceases to influence the culture, historical thinking tends to disappear. And I think one of the most appalling things in recent times has been at about the time we discovered that history is heading for horrors beyond imagination, that people had given up on thinking them in historical terms. It's one of the reasons it's been so hard to get anything, any remotely sensible thinking to play any role in the political world. It's, it's amazing to me when we, are, when we know we are near the end of, of the world we've all adjusted to, that no politician mentions it. It's, it's appalling. And the only place you find a mention of it is in very conservative Christian circles. I mean, mm -hmm. one that has, and uh, what they say, they claim to get it from the Bible, but it's, <laughs> it's basic nature is so different from the way historical thinking operated among the Jews that it's um, <laughs> to think of, to transform history into predictions of details of what's going to happen. That's, that's a radical change. So I, I don't think that the people who use the Bible in that way are being biblical. So you think it's biblical to understand the Bible historically? I, I don't know how else one could understand it. It is, it is a history. The, the Bible is a book of stories organized in historical way. And the, the prophets appealed to past events in order to give direction to how we should live now. And Jesus thought of himself as Messiah. The Messiah is a fully historical term. That, I don't think any Jews thought of the Messiah as uh, an ahistorical being who would present to us a new set of doctrines or, or something purely spiritual. The Messiah was supposed to redeem the people of Israel. That, that's history. You, I think you have to work awfully hard to turn it into something else, but I think a lot of Christians have worked awfully hard. What are those other things that they've turned it into that you oppose, just very briefly? Well, of course, the, 
the the current uh, group that is most powerful is is the one that is so favorable to Zionism, and then of course predicts the end of Judaism. So the, the Jews love one half of it, but they, it's it's a it's a crazy thing. Uh, what else is it? it, it well, uh, I, I think the most common is to turn it into a book of rules and laws. And um, that is not totally unfaithful to Judaism. To the, the, uh, I think the, the prophets were all anti-legalists, but law was another form of Judaism. But it's certainly unfaithful to Jesus and Paul. The, the people who Jesus was most critical of were the Pharisees. And he was critical of them for being legalists. And of course, for Paul, he writes at great length about how we are free from the law. And then how people manage to abstract some things from Paul and turn them into laws, I, it, it's beyond my, my comprehension. No, it's not. I know there is a natural human desire to have rules that they can impose on other people, especially, to make them do what they want them to do. I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not beyond understanding. But it's... It, it turns Jesus and Paul into the exact opposites of what they were. And it isn't hard to read them. And I, I'm so appalled by the way in which Paul is used for legalisms against homosexuality. Mm -hmm. It's very, if you read the one passage where he talks about homosexuality and he thinks it's unnatural. I, 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 I'm not trying to say Paul is completely right about it, but almost everybody thought homosexuality was unnatural until very, very recently. Um, but the passage ends, judge not that she be not judged. Well, why don't they get that far? Why, why do you quit when you get to the end of the negative statements about homosexuality? Paul, Paul has one central message there. Don't judge. And people judge. And they blame it on Paul. Or they give Paul the credit for the fact that they judge. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's hard for me to be patient with that kind of stuff. John, a couple, couple last questions. Uh, you're a Methodist. You're a Methodist minister. Uh, you've been part of the church. You go to church regularly, is that, as best you can. Um, right, right now, I only go by Zoom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, can you say a word about the importance of church and Christianity or the unimportance? Just what you think about the importance of church. Well, uh, what, one way of putting it is that... Uh, Individuals don't exist as individuals. I am who I am because of the many relationships that I've had. And in spite of the fact that I'm critical of a lot of things that have happened. You see, it, Jesus did not come to create a church. But that's what's, what happened because he he did come to create commun human communities. And I think today, creating human communities is extremely important. I, I worry that um, the, the church may be failing in fulfilling its mission of being a real community. The di it, different factions of the church are behaving differently, but I personally find a supportive community there. 
Now, it's not what I would like. 90% of my actual work I have to do not as a member of the church. In other words, the United Methodist Church doesn't support my actions. I have to create different new organizations to do it. So I'm not a... I'm very strongly in favor of communities of faithful people. But uh, if the community is not able to honestly deal with the real issues of life, it's not worth a whole lot. And so I'm for what it for what it can still do. I, I celebrate, but my uh, I, I am more fully involved in communities that are not that do not call themselves churches. Mm -hmm. Most of the people in them are Christians. I think Jesus said, "Where two or three are gathered together in my name, I, I mean, I'm with them." Uh, I think that in the early church, there was a spirit that I have also experienced sometimes in groups of people, and I think it was the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit can still work in churches even despite all the bad things we have done. <laughs> and and uh, in comparison with the secular world, which has become completely nihilistic really, um, the church is great. The kind of church I grew up in, pietistic, yeah. Uh, social gospel, yes. Either of those is a great improvement over secularism. And the fact that it is far removed and far less than what the church should be doesn't mean I, I give up on the church altogether. I want to say, I want to say that I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned the Holy Spirit uh, at the end of our conversation. Uh, number one, because I know I'll have some people that want to know if that's a phrase that you use and a reality that you uh, believe is real. Uh, but number two, because I think that many people have been touched by the Holy Spirit um, in part through your life and ministry and work. And we all just kind of want to thank you. And I know that you've been touched by the Holy Spirit by other people too, no question about it. And you're a humble person, but I really want to thank you for our time together today. And I hope um, that you've been able to say what you want to say. If there's anything else you want to say right now, please do it. Uh, anything is fine. Uh, I want to say that at this stage of my life, I take great joy in the fact that there are people like Jay McDaniel. And Thank fortunately, you. you're not alone. There are, there are hundreds of people who are um, deeply committed and doing creative and original things in creative and original ways. And I certainly don't take credit for them in any kind of unique way, but uh, that I had the chance to be their teacher at one point or have influence in another way makes me feel a part of a community. Paul was their community of saints. And if we understand that for him, people, anybody in the church was a saint once one was being sanctified. And I think the process of sanctification is taking place. Mm -hmm. Well, John, thank you so much. And uh, may the rest of this day and these coming years be great for you. Um, and we'll keep working together. Many, many blessings to you and to all.
Okay. Conversations in Process is a co-production of the Cobb Institute and Open Horizons. If you'd like to support this podcast and help us realize our aim to advance wisdom, harmony, and the common good, please consider making a donation by visiting cobb.institute. That's cobb.institute and clicking on the donate button.